In his 1988 apostolic letter, Mulieris Dignitatem, The Dignity and Vocation of Women, Pope St. John Paul II explained in great depth, with his usual philosophical acumen and biblical insight, what is plainly true. The Church owes its women an enormous debt of gratitude. He wrote, The Church gives thanks for all the manifestations of the feminine genius which have appeared in the course of history, in the midst of all peoples and nations. She gives thanks for all the charisms which the Holy Spirit distributes to women in the history of the people of God, for all the victories which she owes to their faith, hope, and charity. She gives thanks for all the fruits of feminine holiness. Our Blessed Mother Mary sets the tone, not only as the premier exemplar of the feminine genius, but as the icon of sanctity for both women and men. We share with all Christians an admiration for Mary's courageous yes to God. And as Catholics, we understand that we depend upon her continual intercession to obtain the grace of her Son. We acknowledge Our Lady first among all the saints, but her story is accompanied by those of many other women who have played pivotal roles in the advance of the kingdom of God over many centuries. Some of their names are known to us, while others are not. Some important women in the history of the church have been faithful mothers, like Monica. Some were monarchs, like Elizabeth of Portugal. Some wear the martyr's crown, like Joan of Arc. Others served humbly where no one else would go, like Mother Teresa. Some were doctors of the church, like Catherine of Siena. Others were freed slaves, like Josephine Baquita. Some were celibate, some were married, some were rich, some were poor. There is no end to the riches of the stories of women of the church. And there is therefore always much more that we all may learn. To address this need, Ignatius Press and the Augustan Institute have published a new book with the apt title, Women of the Church, What Every Catholic Should Know, written by church historian Bronwyn McShay. Taking us from the first century to the 21st century, McShay highlights the achievement of Catholic women from different places and backgrounds. McShay tells us, I have written this book for Catholic readers of all ages as a shortcut to stories about women of the church that took me years to learn and piece together on my own. But she further explains, this book is for anyone interested in the history of Catholicism to demonstrate that the history of the church's women is the church's history, just as much as the history of her men is. Bronwyn McShea received her PhD at Yale and her master's degree at Harvard. She is an historian, writer, speaker, and artist based in New York City, and also a visiting assistant professor with the Augustan Institute Graduate School in Denver. She is the author of La Duchesse, The Life of Marie de Vigneron, Cardinal Richelieu's forgotten heiress who shaped the fate of France. It is my pleasure to welcome Bronwyn McShay to the Ignatius Press Podcast. Bronwyn McShay, welcome to the Ignatius Press Podcast. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. Well, I'm really glad to talk to you today because I enjoyed your book very much. We're talking about the book, Women of the Church, What Every Catholic Should Know. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very easy to read book, but also very informative and very helpful, I think, to everyone who picks it up. Um, let me read to you something that you said in the preface. You okay. said, I have written this book for Catholic readers of all ages as a shortcut to stories about women of the church that took me years to learn and piece together on my own. Tell us more about that. How did you come to, to write this book? Sure. Well, it, it grew out of the immediate cause was it, it grew out of uh, a teaching opportunity. I currently teach for the Augustan Institute in Denver, and I was asked 
a couple of years ago to develop a course on women of the church, the history of women in the church. And um, as I was putting lectures together for that, um, it occurred to some of us at the Augustine Institute that this could potentially be a book for the What Every Catholic Should Know series. Um, but I also, uh, I was getting into the subject of kind of surprising history of Catholic women more broadly. I, my last book is a biography of a French duchess, um, the niece of Cardinal Richelieu. And both she and various other figures that I learned about, especially in graduate school, like after I was kind of more, you know, mature in my faith when I was young, I just realized there were so many fascinating women in the history of Catholicism, some, some of them not necessarily canonized, others just not well known when sometimes canonized or beatified that I wish I had known sooner. It would have sort of made me look at the sort of treasury of the church's experience with regard to men and women differently than I, I was raised with uh, some of the more iconic stories that I grew up with. And I just wanted to just put my knowledge in a, in a palatable form for ordinary readers, especially fellow Catholics, uh, so that they could learn about, you know, whether young or older readers, they could learn about uh, the, the vast array of remarkable women that are in, in the church's past. And so that, that's how the book came about. Yeah, I really appreciate the, that vast array that you talked mm -hmm. about. You know, I, I, I find this when I think about saints, but as you say, not all of the women that you talk about are canonized mm -hmm. saints, but, you know, there's a, sometimes we, we maybe it's just our, in our own minds or something, each of us tends to kind of think of saints or, mm -hmm. or special people in the church in a very particular kind of way, but actually, mm -hmm. You know, not all saints are celibates, for example. Not all mm -hmm. saints are, you know, really churchy types. I mean, mm -hmm. it, they're they're all types, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I appreciated that you the women that you depict are, you know, some of them are some of them were mothers, some of them were mm -hmm. celibates, some of them mm -hmm. were, you know, political leaders, some of them were nuns. You know, um, just what was going through your mind as you were sort of thinking about which women to include? Yes, well, I mean, there are certain women I had to include and wanted to because the, the book is, I it had only 60,000 words for this book just because of the, the series uh, that it's in. And the series is what every Catholic should know. So there are some great female saints, such as the four women doctors of the church that I had to give a lot of attention to and wanted to. Um, famous saints like Joan of Arc or Mother Teresa of Calcutta would, of course, get kind of coverage in such a book. Uh, but in thinking about the variety of other women to include, I really wanted to give a representative sampling of canonized, beatified, and sometimes just very historically important women who were Catholic, who for whatever reason have not been canonized, or maybe shouldn't in the case of maybe Isabel of Spain, but she, but she was a remarkable Catholic figure. I wanted to kind of give e each time period roughly equal representation. And the... the um, the sort of balance of women religious, women who are mothers, women who are in political life in some cases, uh, to give them kind of not necessarily parity, because many of the saints, I think, were celibate religious. And, and I was actually blown away by the vast legacy of that as I was, I was writing it. I had a respect for that to begin with, but I, I kind of, I surprised myself how much I wanted to talk about 19th century nuns of various kinds and, and secular congregations too. But uh, yeah, I wanted to give a sense of the church as it existed, as it has existed and exists today historically with the, the full range of vocations that women have lived. And so I sometimes prioritized maybe a lesser known saint who helped represent a historical moment particularly well versus maybe a, a saint with greater name recognition who was a bit more of an outlier from kind of historical, in a historical frame, because I am a historian first and foremost, so. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, naturally the book starts with a saint that everyone will have heard of, mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, and that is Our Lady, St. Mary, um, but your book is called What Every Catholic Should Know. So mm -hmm. I wonder, what, what did you focus on when you talked about Mary at kind of the beginning of the book as a way of introducing, you know, all these other great women that you're talking about? Sure. I mean, that was in some ways the hardest. How, how do you talk? Mary is so important to all of us as Catholics in a very personal way, as well as just in terms of her her power in the church, her spiritual significance. So that, that was a bit tricky for me. I, I wanted to stress, however, that um, 
especially at that moment at the foot of the cross is where I begin the book. When, when Christ tells her, uh, looks at John and says, you know, he's your son. And, and then John, this is your mother, that that is a kind of founding moment for the church, that her role as a mother of the church is being um, kind of authorized by Christ himself there. And that without her acceptance of this, just like without her acceptance of, of the, um, the incarnation, when, when the annunciation happens in a sense, without that, that human willing, uh, willing that she does, um, the history of the church would not have happened as it has, right? So I wanted to underscore both her primal role as mother of God and mother of the church, but also her really crucial historical role for the church. Um, and she sets a pattern in a way for other women around her. And, you know, just it, it, to me, it's historically significant, whether you're Catholic or otherwise, she is the most written about, sung about, talked about woman in the history of humanity. I, I can't quite think of anyone else who would compete with her. So I made sure to say that as well. Not that it's a contest, but um, yeah, so I had to kind of boil that down in just a few paragraphs and that that was not easy to do. So... Yeah. Well, you did a great job of that. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, people picking up the book will just immediately, you know, read what you say about Mary and remember that, of course, although a lot of the women that you write about are maybe people they've never heard of and that there is a sort of whole other story that needs to be told about, about saintly women. But in a sense, like the one of the most famous people who's ever lived on the planet Earth is, is Mary, is a woman. Mm -hmm. And so we start with her. And so I really appreciated that. But as you say, she sort of opens then the conversation to these other important women mm -hmm. throughout the history of the church, but but particularly in that early period. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the other, the other women kind of in the early church that you talked about? I mean, I, of course, give some attention uh, to Mary Magdalene. Um, some of the the first, the, the women, they're not named in every case who help the apostles, sort of patronesses of the apostles, helping feed them, make sure they got certain places uh, as they're spreading the gospel. Um, I, I was really fascinated by some of the women connected to the church fathers, getting a little bit further into the early church period. Um, uh, uh, Saint Jerome uh, was friends with a Roman matron who was uh, very important to him. Um, uh, Macrina, the younger, the sister of two church fathers. I learned about her from a colleague at the Augustan Institute and just had fun learning about her and, and just how important she was. And she would sometimes, you know, correct her brothers who were famous church fathers. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. And even getting a little bit further along, I was really shocked to learn that one of the early councils of the church the Second Council of Nicaea was called together by a woman, the Empress of the Byzantine Empire, um, Irene of Athens. She was not necessarily a saintly figure. She played sort of a rough game with her son, who she was not allowing to be on the throne um, for various reasons. This was uh, settling the iconoclasm controversy. And that, to me, it just as a historical moment, I mean, uh, we hear all the time, I, I, at least I have, that, that women have had no role of any serious kind in the church over the centuries until recent times. That's kind of a, a mantra I hear a lot. And I, I think I wish I'd known as a child that one of the emperors who called together a church council was a woman um, and that and that the church fathers were very dependent sometimes upon the intellectual quality of the conversations they were having with certain women. And um, yeah, so there's a, there's a variety. And I, I, I'm more comfortable in the later period because I'm trained uh, as an early modern historian. But um, so I, I learned a lot while, while putting this book together as well as gave a lot to readers. Yeah, I, I liked it, you know, just to dwell on the early church stuff for one more minute. I, I liked how there were, how you, you showed us a variety of, right from the start, a variety of different kinds of women. You know, you have, um, I, I didn't, I never knew the story of St. Felicity who, you know, who was killed, who was martyred right mm -hmm. after she gave birth, mm -hmm. which was such a powerful, a powerful thing. Yes. And then, you know, you've got Helena, the mother of Constantine, yes. a whole, yes. a whole yes. different kind of woman. Right. So I just mm -hmm. appreciated the different, the, the, the variety there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I wanted to connect them to these historical moments, um, you know, Felicity and Perpetua, are invoked in, in the liturgy on some occasions uh, during the liturgical year. And most Catholics will hear their name occasionally at mass and not necessarily know who they were. 
and uh, their their bravery in dealing with the the early Christian perse persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire. Um, it, it it was sort of staggering to some people, and it it, it led to conversions. And um, yeah, and, and the mother of Constantine the Great, she was a convert. She um, was a pagan woman who fell in love with a Roman soldier, and the fruit of that not necessarily a uh, legal union. I'm not sure if they were married at the time, it's unclear, becomes the emperor uh, of, of, of Rome who ends up converting to Christianity. And so you, you don't have Constantine the Great without St. Helena. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and likewise, you know, there's, uh, in, a, in a different way, there's Monica who stands mm -hmm. behind Augustine, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the kind of the the mother who, in, who gives us one of these one of these great figures in the history mm -hmm. of the church. Mm -hmm. And then also there's, um, to kind of transition into the Middle Ages, we're, we're, we're getting there, but um, just one, one more brief stop with um, St. Uh, Scholastica, who then uh, we pair with, um, with Benedict. And so then, you know, we're, we're looking at a woman who is this extremely important figure in what ultimately becomes you know, this huge force in the church of mm -hmm. monasticism, the monastic life. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciated how you talked about uh, Scholastica. And, uh, you know, I hope, you know, some of our readers will know about Benedict, but to, mm -hmm. to learn more about Scholastica mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And I don't, uh, in every case, give more than a few sentences or a few paragraphs, uh, but the book is designed uh, to be a window into this history. And hopefully I give, you know, footnotes with further reading. Um, yeah, and I so I erred on the side of including as many as possible uh, to represent versus kind of going deep with with everyone's portraits, um, yeah. just to make sure people are aware. And because uh, every every reader of this book will have a different vocation or reason why they're reading it, and that they will I assume they will respond to a different variety of figures as they're going along, um, in an yeah. individual way. Yeah, Bronwyn, and I think because mm -hmm. this book is so clearly pitched to a popular audience, I think everybody mm -hmm. will really appreciate that, that they can, you know, they can kind of just pick up a bit of information about the saints that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, learn more about ones they already know and learn something new about mm -hmm. people they've never heard of. Mm -hmm. Let's move into the Middle Ages, sure. where we have a number of really big, shall we say, big deal women mm -hmm. saints. Mm -hmm. um, I was struck, maybe we could just pause here for a moment. I was struck that you mentioned you know, so I was thinking about how you 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 spend a bit of time on Hildegard of Bingen, mm -hmm. and also you mentioned in passing Christine de Pizan, who mm -hmm. um, she she's and both of those saints I would say are are relatively popular even among sort of non Catholics, non Christian types, people who are interested in kind of medieval history mm -hmm. yes. and kind of even women's studies stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I really liked how you talked about them in the same context that you're talking about St. Clair and ultimately Joan of Arc, right? This great group of mm -hmm. women medieval saints. So uh, maybe I've already said too much. Let me throw it back to you and just hear. No, yeah, your... I mean, the medieval period that um, is striking for various reasons, in part because you have, in some cases, powerful abbesses, abbesses, a territorial abbess like Hildegard of Bingen. She had several, by the end of her life, several convents under her authority. Um, they had under the church's laws of the time, which were a bit more organic, it was not sort of a codified uh, canon law code the way we have in modern times, they had certain powers equivalent to a territorial bishop. They, of course, didn't ordain. They were not ordained clergy, but they, in terms of their governance of other Christians in spiritual matters, as well as, uh, so so an abbess such as Hildegard of Bingen um, it's kind of an elevated figure, not not that it's a power game, but um, but it, that I think that's one reason she fascinates uh, women's historians who are maybe coming at this with a very secular uh, attitude, um, because she produced a lot theologically. She wrote a lot. Uh, she did not paint herself, but she had um, women kind of represent uh, images that came to her mind or her her mysticism moments and had these remarkable paintings done. So, and she was a composer of music. So she's kind of a giant figure in um, medieval times, just in terms of understanding what certain women through the monastic uh, life were able to achieve, you know, independent of the kind of Catholic commitments that they had. But she also, um, I mean, she's a, uh, 
doctor of the church now, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, grew up learning about her as a German Catholic, and he helped elevate her. She was kind of um, it, it's equivalent canonization, they call it. She was basically by popular acclaim already considered a saint by the church, but he formally confirmed that canonization in 2010, just before declaring her a doctor of the church. Um, and her, her theological writings were respected by Pope Eugene III. He encouraged her writing. Um, in terms of other medieval figures, uh, I mean, I give a lot of attention to Catherine of Siena as well, another doctor of the church. She was my patron saint. She was given to me as a patron saint as a Catholic child uh, by my parents. My middle name is Catherine. And so she's one of the women of the church I knew a lot about growing up. Um, I never could quite relate to her because she um, she liked to fast, number one. I, I'm not into fasting. I, I try to be once in a while. Um, she became a Dominican tertiary she told uh, a pope what to do uh, to, to move back to Rome. She was a mystic. She, she just was a very kind of out of reach figure for me uh, as, as one of my models of, of Catholic womanhood growing up. Um, and so she's one of these figures that is historically quite important as well as a kind of giant in terms of the, the mystical and theological um, legacy she left behind. Um, that I want to make sure to represent, but also put her in context with a variety of other kinds of women who were not kind of called to the particular path that someone like Catherine, Catherine Siena was. Um, yeah, so maybe now I'm going on too long. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, no, not at all. No, I, you know, I, I think here we uh, we really start to encounter, and obviously some of the early ones we we may have heard of, but we really once we really get into the book, you know, this this kind of period where you're talking about the medieval the medieval women, and then transitioning into some of these kind of Renaissance and early modern women mm -hmm. who were not only um, who who I guess now we start to look at some women who have some real earthly power too. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned before um, Isabel, uh, Isabel of Castile, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's also Maria Teresa of Austria mm -hmm. and Marie Antoinette. Mm -hmm. Now that was one that I think our readers would really like to know more about. Why did you include Marie Antoinette in your book? Well, because I have this frame, um, women of the church, not women saints of the church, but women of the church, what every Catholic should know. Um, and I have this, this concern to make sure that historically very important Catholic women are included, even if they were not in every case saintly. Um, her story really matters for the history of the church, Marie Antoinette. She was a Catholic queen. She was, um, you know, not, not a saint in her personal life, it seems. Um, she probably had an affair with a Swedish count. It appears to have been the case. Um, and her, she kind of was um, a bit more recalcitrant than her husband, King Louis XVI, when efforts were trying to be made to reform the French monarchy on the eve of the French Revolution. And so she she played an important role in sort of the, the break that happens with some of the nobles joining in with the revolution and opposing uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France. And the French Revolution ends up having tremendous ramifications for how the church is, uh, uh, its relationships with European monarchical states going forward, which is a complicated history. It's not as simple as the church is being overthrown. Um, and I try to explain that in kind of everyday terms as well. Um, I just thought I should include her because she she also to me is one of the most famous women in history. And she was a Roman Catholic and she, um, when she was uh, in prison, um, you know, she had a prayer book with her. There was a crucifix on the wall and um, the French, some of the very pious, more kind of right-wing Catholic uh, people in France consider Louis and Marie Antoinette a bit like saints, but I, I wouldn't go that far um, because they, they see them as martyrs of this, of this period. But um, I just thought she needed to be included. And her mother, Maria Therese of Austria, is probably one of the most powerful Catholic women who ever walked the earth because she was basically the, she wasn't Holy Roman Emperor uh, per se. Her husband was a figurehead Holy Roman Emperor. She was, for all intents and purposes, the the imperial monarch um, in the 18th century, vast territory. And, and her reign was very important for the history of the church in the 18th century. So, yeah. Well, I think Marie Antoinette is one of those figures who is so kind of caricatured in the minds of people. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, it's really important to kind of 
rethink who mm -hmm. she was a little mm -hmm. bit. And I really love how you talk about, you situate her as a woman of the church. Yeah. It's just a really important thing. Yeah. And I'm not trying to resuscitate, you know, I don't have special love for Marie Antoinette, I, you know, just to clarify that. Um, but I, I just think she belongs in the story. She's among the Catholic women. I think we should all know something about. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while we're continuing this thread, the, in the aftermath of the French revolution, you, you, you tell us about various women who were sort of, um, I don't know, sort of instrumental in keeping the faith alive in the mm -hmm. midst of mm -hmm. what was, you know, a, a pretty pretty awful time uh, there for the church. You even tell this one funny story about what some women did to a kind of mm -hmm. fake clergyman of the state. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, it's one of the more colorful moments in the book. And I, I have the historian Olwen Houghton to thank, to thank for this, because this comes straight out of a book she wrote on, on women in the French Revolutionary period. Um, they, they were, so the French revolutionary government after the reign, after the, during the reign of terror period, when you have this kind of very radical cabal takes over the French state, they impose um, state approved clergymen on the churches throughout France. And, you know, they have, there's some really extreme moments like uh, Notre Dame Cathedral was turned into a temple of reason. And, and um, so the clergy are kind of puppets of the new revolutionary state. And the question of their valid ordination is a big one. Um, some of them are not as really validly ordained. So there, um, anyway, there's this one small parish, saint Vincent, and in, in, um, I think it's, I forget the name of the French town offhand, uh, Le Puy en Velay, I think is it, is the name. Um, there were, uh, there was a, a, a homily by one of these, state approved clergymen uh, in front of the dignitaries of the town and the people of the town, most of whom are kind of unlettered peasant class people. And the Catholic women in the rural parts of France were not very happy with the French Revolution because they saw it as an attack on the church and the, and the monarchy. A lot of peasants were a bit more traditional minded and resistant to the revolution, which is something people don't always realize. They, they sort of falsely picture the French Revolution as a peasant uprising. Uh, it's not the case um, for the most part. In some, some regions it was. But anyway, long story short, uh, this, you know, well-dressed clergyman of the state gets up there and the women of the parish suddenly en masse get up together, turn around and moon him. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a very, you know, ridiculous moment. I wouldn't recommend that as sort of a pious exercise if you don't like a homily. But um, apparently he just sort of like starts muttering and then he left in haste with some of the the elite dignitaries uh going after him and apparently women in a neighboring town repeated this and it was one of their only ways of kind of showing their commitment to the legitimate mass and the legitimate clergy some of these women actually more heroically they hide some of the clergy in their homes or, or they face down um public officials policemen trying to force certain uh, practices on on their churches and Olwen Houghton and other historians have kind of shown that um, this resistance was really integral in putting the brakes on French revolutionary radicalism and eventually it, it's turned around and the Catholic Church is kind of, it's not reestablished fully, but it, it's given uh, state recognition uh, even under Napoleon in a, in a particular way, so. Well, that was one of my favorite parts of the book. I have to say, just the okay. the image okay. of these of these just ordinary women doing what they can do. You know, it's something kind of kind of kind of unusual, but doing what they can do for the sake of the faith. And you know, it's sometimes that's that's yeah. all we can ask, right? I laughed about it. I don't know if uh, uh, viewers um, when I was young, the movie Braveheart came out, and uh, mm -hmm. there's a moment where the Scottish peasants are trying to show the the um, English lords what they think of them and and it's it's a shocking kind of scene in the film uh to to put it on film but I thought of that scene when I when I read about this and um anyway so again I'm not recommending this to people for the present day but it, it's it's a I wanted to represent on a more serious note I wanted to represent even unnamed Catholic women who were important in the history of the church and uh French women many of them nameless who helped defend the church during this period many English women, some of whom became well-known, who defended the church during the Protestant Reformation. They're, I wanted to make sure they're represented in the book, even though they don't have um, kind of books written about them by name, like some other saints do. So 
Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend that, that anyone lift their skirts if they, if they don't like where father moved the statue or something no. like that. But you know, if, yeah. a, if, if the state imposed fake priests upon us, then, you know, maybe that would be a different matter. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows what we'd have to do in that case, but right. Right. Well, let's stick with England then for a moment. We've, there's so many wonderful French women and there's more to come, but let's, um, there, the, the English Reformation is such a, such a fraught time and such a, such a strange story and, and unique in many ways. Um, tell us about the women that you wrote about in that context. Right. Well, I, I probably give the most attention first to the daughter of St. Thomas More, of course, who was um, executed by Henry VIII for his refusal to accept the royal marriage uh, with, with Anne Boleyn um, and his fidelity to the church. Thomas More's daughter, Margaret More Roper, was one of the most educated women in Europe. With her father's encouragement, um, she wrote uh, in, uh, she was she was excellent at Latin and Greek. She wrote um, her own works, not most of which have not survived, unfortunately. And she was crucial in making sure his story was told uh, in full. She and her husband um, wrote the first biography, basically, of Thomas More. Um, and so she's represented as a scholar as well as a kind of English Reformation figure. Um, but I also talk about some of the women in the um, the later Elizabethan period, who um, uh, uh, between that, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm sort of smushing it all together. The the Arab Edward the Sixth and then uh, Elizabeth. Um, there were a number of uh, English noble women like Margaret Clitheroe and several other saints who uh, would hide priests in their home, or they made sure that. They, they were very concerned about the Catholic mass being preserved and sometimes they had them in their homes or they, they helped, um, you know, preserve the faith in various other ways. And some of them were martyred themselves. Uh, they were arrested for their activities. And so I, I represent them. I also include um, Mary the first, the queen of England. She tried to return England uh, to its Catholic, um, being officially Catholic as a, as a regime. Um, but she she dies early on uh, in her reign, so so she's of course included. Yeah, so I, I mean I try to give representation to the variety that were involved in that scene as well. Yeah, I, I thought that was all really interesting, mm -hmm. and that kind of um, transitions us to thinking about the new world. I mean, we're sort of on the, we, we've we've come through you know the the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, and now European powers are going mm -hmm. to start fanning out all over the world, and with it, um, the faith. So mm -hmm. you know you you get into important women figures in in the New World in the Americas. You both mm -hmm. focus on you focus on the European women who come mm -hmm. over, but then also on the Native women who mm -hmm. become kind of the first the first Christian women. Uh, mm -hmm. You know in in the new world tell us about some of those and and uh you know their importance sure i mean i spend the most time so my my own training as a scholar is in early modern french history and french colonial history so my first book was actually about the jesuit mission to north america in the 17th and 18th century and the figure of saint kateri tekagwitha uh is is probably the most well-known she is the most well-known native american saint the only native american canonized saint, I, I believe, um, from North America. Um, pardon me if I just made a mistake with that. Um, but, but so she, uh, she died in 1680. She was part of one of the Jesuits mission villages of, of convert, mostly Iroquois Catholics. Um, and she, uh, contracted smallpox when, when she was young. And so she, she sort of had scarring on her face and was um, sick most of her life. She did not live to be very old. She died in her early twenties, but she was one of several native American women in her context that uh, committed themselves to celibacy. They were not actually permitted to become nuns. There were restrictions on native women becoming nuns in this period um, as part of the colonial uh, the kind of some of the downsides of what's going on colonially. So they they kind of joined together as basically privately consecrated laywomen devoted to charitable works and and teaching the faith um, to others. And uh, the Jesuits considered her to be very holy when they knew her and considered her immediately to be a saint. 
and encouraged her uh, a sort of cult to develop around her when she died. Uh, but there were some other Native women um, that I mentioned that I basically know from my advanced research into the subject that I bring in there, even though they're not, um, we don't have enough on them, I think, for causes of canonization to ensue. So, yeah, I tried to give representation there. I talk a bit about the uh, Latin American context, although I highlight there St. Rose of Lima, who's of Spanish ancestry, um, and several other figures. And I also made sure to include, uh, people don't know this, there's a lot of interest in the new movie about Mother Cabrini, if I can mention that. Um, and she's presented there as one of the first women missionaries in the history of the church, but there were actually French women serving as missionaries in, in the 17th century in, in colonial New France. There were Ursulines and uh, Augustinian hospital sisters. And there was even a lay, uh, a lay hospital administrator and foundress named Jeanne Mance in, in New France, who I include as well. I, I just think people should know that women were involved in these early scenes in the church's history, where figures like the Jesuits have gotten a lot of play, including from me writing about them. But there were also women that were, that were part of this story that have not gotten the same attention. Yeah, and this is maybe a conversation for another time, but I mean, I think even the, the wider picture of the activity of the French and the Spanish mm -hmm. in the New World is something that is not, it actually isn't that well known. I mean, we yeah. learn kind of the English story and the, mm -hmm. the revolution yes. and all of that sort of thing, but there are all these, you know, all this activity going on. Mm -hmm. And a yeah. lot of it is, you know, very much focused on mission. And, you know, there are these women involved as you, as you show us. Right. And you sort of happened upon one of my sneaky uh, intentions with this book is is actually also to just teach people some basic history um, and that they might not certain gaps may be there. So through the women's stories, I'm also trying to present the history of the church through them and the, the and the history of the church's complicated relationships to a lot of different political orders over time. Um, you know, that has ups and downs attached to it. So I, I'm not trying to glorify the relationship to colonialism, but it's it was there and it's part of what the church was at the time. And, and I think Catholics should know, ha have a fuller picture than maybe kind of Catholics growing up in North America. That's one of the examples. I, I, I grew up with a very Anglo-centric um, view of the colonial period. I pictured English uh, English officers getting kicked out by by the heroic Americans. And I remember seeing the movie Last of the Mohicans when I was young, and I became weirdly fascinated by the French bad guys in the story. And my, mm -hmm. I remember my brother was like, you know, why would you like these French characters? <laughs> but but I was like, what? Because I didn't know. Apparently they were there too. So I had this kind of fascination, even from childhood, in learning more about the French and Spanish story of North America. Yeah, I've, I've been enjoying lately learning more about that story too. And your book definitely fills in some of those gaps. So I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. You know, though, a figure that you do write about that in some respects is very much a creature of the kind of typical American narrative would be Elizabeth Ann Seton. Mm -hmm. But what a what a wonderful story that she mm -hmm. sort of is very much of the, of the kind of original story, but then mm -hmm. converts to Catholicism. Yep. And she's a special saint to me. So I appreciated that you included ah, her. Okay. What, yeah, what, um, what, 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 yeah, what is yeah, she's also a special saint. I had, um, Patricia Snow, wonderful writer, do the foreword to the book. Um, and, and, and she's a convert to the faith, and Elizabeth Ann Seton's conversion is, is important to her. So I, I, I first learned about her actually through Patricia Snow some years back when we first became friends. Um, so sorry, I now I forgot the the specific question you just asked about her. Well, so. I, I I may have already mm -hmm. I may have already handled it, but just mm -hmm. you know you, the significance of including Elizabeth Ann Seton in the yeah. book. Yeah, I mean she's the first. Uh, she's not the first American canonized, but for the first in order of when they lived, uh, of the young United States who becomes a canonized saint. And I live in New York City. She she's from New York. She was from the sort of upper crust Episcopalian mm -hmm. uh, society here back in uh, the late 18th century. And you know she was a good devoted Episcopalian. Her husband died um, uh, unfortunately young when she had five children. She was still raising, and she was in Italy. She was uh, she brought her husband to Italy and uh, to hopefully. Um, have his health turn around, but he ended up dying in Italy. And, and partly because she's accidentally in Italy 
being hosted by business partners of her husband's. Uh, while she's in mourning, she decides to just stay there for a few months and she becomes exposed to Catholicism in its deeper European traditional form, not in the form of some of the, um, I can say this because I'm Irish, the unsavory immigrants are starting to come <laughs> into North, the, the peasant class immigrants that, you know, that sort of ethnic uh, Catholics who were coming into New York would not be someone she would be wanting to imitate just realistically in her time. So she's exposed to Catholicism in this whole new context. And, and um, yeah, she becomes just a crucial founding figure for American Catholicism. Yeah, wonderful so, figure. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump back across the Atlantic to France in the 19th century, where so the, the French Revolution has happened, the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. has happened. You know, the world is really different. Mm -hmm. And there are these two, I mean, there are many, of course, but there are two that certainly spring to my mind, and you talk about them, two women French saints who embody this like very you know, kind of almost like this desire for re-enchantment that we have in this world that has changed so much. And that's uh, Bernadette of Lourdes and then St. Therese of Lisieux. You you include both of them and mm -hmm. others. Am I getting that right, the significance of them? I mean, you know, this, yeah. this, yeah. I think, well, Bernadette of Lourdes, I think her world was already still pretty enchanted because she's in mm -hmm. a kind of remote um, kind of mountain mountainous area where peasants are, but economically it was not a great, time for some of these communities. So there's a mix where that you have people who, who have traditional religiosity, but the kind of um, the industrial world is starting to depress a lot of uh, localities where people are making their money in traditional ways. And so she's in that context. I bring her up in part, I she's sort of in some ways the first celebrity saint because newspapers are, are really become coming into the fore at this time, and the stories of her of the apparitions at Lourdes, it was it was like a media frenzy of a kind you really couldn't have had even 10, 20 years earlier, just with the the media culture of the time. And so she is just trying to follow what's happening here with the visions and just do what Blessed Mother, you know, is asking of her. But all this media attention, she faced a lot of temptation to. Um, you know, do interviews and to promote herself. And people wanted her to bless medals and things like that. And she really kind of, she revolted against this and she decided to become a nun, partly just to get away from the the public scrutiny. Um, and she, she particularly joined a community that asked her no questions about Lourdes. The other communities uh, that she spoke to wanted her to come because they wanted this celebrity figure. <laughs> you know, even the convents of the time were thinking of marketing themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. So the world that she lived in was not that different from ours in some ways. So Therese of Lisieux, uh, you know, her parents were fairly uh, decently well-off middle-class people uh, trained in um, lace making. Uh, and they, they had, they were financially more stable as a family. Um, but her parents were unusual. I think people know uh, might know this already. Uh, both her parents um, are canonized saints now too. They had both considered independently religious vocations and were rejected in different ways by their communities. And so one of the found the reasons they uh, sort of bonded with each other and decided to get married is because they had the shared experience of not uh, being able to pursue religious vocations that they had wanted to. And um, some people describe, you know, some very accomplished uh, children are, are, are pursuing the the unrealized dreams of their parents. I think Therese and all of her sisters who became nuns in some ways were, were living the, the unrealized dreams of their parents. Hmm. And she becomes um, also one of the most best-selling saints. As soon as she died, her journals become, um, they, they, they were more widely read than almost any Catholic texts of the time. So I keep, I hope the viewers don't mind as a historian, I look at these more worldly things like the, mm -hmm. how, how, what a best-selling author Teresa Lisieux became in death. But that fascinates me because it's, it's like the, where the, the holy and the worldly kind of meet and, and how they're kind of intertwined. That that's really what fascinates me most of all as a Catholic scholar. No. Yeah, it interests me a lot too. And I think, you know, in the last batch of saints, you talk about the kind of the the more, the, the really recent ones. Mm -hmm. um, th this, I think, becomes more and more of a question. Mm -hmm. um, Dorothy Day, for example, mm -hmm. but then maybe even more so, of course, uh, Mother Teresa. You know, mm -hmm. um, there, I remember she appeared, I think, on um, uh, Bill Buckley's show, mm -hmm. Firing Line or something. Mm -hmm. And he, she was very upset with him because she didn't want him to 
invite donations for her, you know, like, or some, mm -hmm. it was some, some kind of story like that, that mm -hmm. she was, but she became this world famous person, right, right in, in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's just a different world that we live in, you know, now, but it's, it's fascinating to consider people like that and what the effect of mm -hmm. living in this more kind of media, media oriented age is and will continue to be for people who are called to holiness and for mm -hmm. these, you know, yeah. these women in particular. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I it's you know you don't want to make simple parallels, but you know someone like Bernadette of Lourdes, if she was living today, everyone would expect her to have her own self-driven Instagram account. You know, mm -hmm. like like it would just be. I mean, that that sounds kind of absurd, but um, so yeah, I mean, we're living in a very different world. But I try to show the, you know, I I don't go on at length, but developments in technology and media are part of the story, uh, and they're part of the story of why certain saints kind of um sort of rise rise to the, the um the attention of the world or the church at the time and and so I, I i try to just illustrate uh how these very social cultural factors of the times in which these particular women are born into how they are part of their story and part of what makes them you know saintly figures or representative figures for their time as well as for the church longer term yeah. Did you feel, you know, I thought, especially when you wrote about Dorothy Day, it, I, I don't know if this was part of what you meant to do, but it seemed to me part of her story is really, um, you know, turning away from or kind of, you know, bucking up against the values mm -hmm. of, of of kind of the political world that she sort of still identifies with, mm -hmm. but differentiates herself in this Catholic way. Right. Um, I, you know, I wonder if that's something that we ought to be kind of looking for in the saints today, you know? Yeah. And I, I always have, um, I, I always can sort of say I'm a historian, so I don't, I, I get to not have to comment on, on things like that. Uh, like I, I don't like to give prescriptions for the present necessarily. Um, but she's a complicated figure to write about. Um, just personally, I don't have a great, uh, love of communists. You know, I, I was raised right. in a very anti-communist home. My dad's a former Marine and, you know, just, I mean, I came come out of a world where people associated with communism are not, uh, you know, the people I necessarily want to hang out with, but I had to get over that prejudice. Um, and I, I did get over that prejudice when I was introduced to her writings, actually in grad school, I read The Long Loneliness in a, in a course at Harvard. And I was, there were several books I was given in graduate school that literally brought me to tears. I'm supposed to just be taking notes and having a scholarly experience. And I had kind of a profound religious response to Dorothy Day as a writer. And I was very moved by her. And yeah, I just, I wanted to represent her both as, as she's beloved by people and ways in which she represents the complexities of the era she lived in and the different commitments she maintained as well as dis distance herself from. Um, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, someone might have a fair criticism for the way I did it. I just tried to do do what I could there um, to, to bring her into the story. So, yeah, and she also lived through, I mean, she had an abortion and she greatly regretted this. And, mm -hmm. you know, she did not become a, sort of a political pro-life advocate. And I don't know if she even would have been comfortable with that. But she she spoke out in very powerful ways through her autobiography about that experience and 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 the regret she had and then the love she has for a, a daughter who's born out of wedlock um as 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 one of the paths uh, you know for redemption that she and her conversion is very much tied up in her commitment to her daughter mm -hmm. and, and raising her daughter in the catholic faith so yeah yeah that all seemed very anti-communist to me that the the concrete experience of becoming a parent opens your eyes to reality yeah you know? yeah so, yes yeah. i mean she yeah. but she did not um she remained very humanly uh, devoted to her friendships and yeah. many of her friendships were on the far left and she did not want to kind of separate herself from them uh, in a fundamental way. So um, yeah, I'm not an expert on her. I'm not an expert on many of the women I talk about, but I, I try to sort of, I tried to bring in my own experience, what I found moving about her as a, mm -hmm. as a Catholic and as a scholar um, into what I said about her. 
Well, you talk about so many women in the book. Obviously, no one could be an expert on all of these women, and right. you do such a such a, an admirable job just sort of going through this history and and um, yep. really teaching us a lot. So, we encourage everybody to pick up the book. It is called "Women of the Church: What Every Catholic Should Know." Now available from Ignatius Press. Bronwyn McShay, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. My pleasure, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me on.